What's up my stat stars, Michael Princhak here, ready to talk to you about every single possible thing you'll ever need to know when it comes to statistical inference for the AEP statistics exam in May. I'm talking about all the different procedures that could possibly come up on the AP stats exam and exactly how to handle them, what they're called, what they look like, and what exactly you need to be able to do. Now, I also have a packet that goes over every single one of these different inference procedures with a full example. In the beginning of the packet, I also go through the different steps that's required in every one of these procedures. It's pretty awesome. I think it'll be pretty beneficial for you to look over and use to practice because one of these problems, or maybe even more, is guaranteed to come up on the AP stats exam in May. Now, to access this packet, all you got to do is head over to the Ultimate Review Packet for AP Statistics, sign up for a free trial, and with that free trial, you will get access to this document. All you got to do once you're in is scroll down the left-hand side to the bottom where you see resources for the AP Statistics exam, and in that spot, you will find, I call the Inference Bible because it's got everything you need to know about statistical inference. So what is inference? Inference is using sample statistics to make a judgment about a population parameter. Now we've learned about a couple different sample statistics this year, but the most famous ones we've learned about are p hat, the proportion from a sample. And we could use the proportion from a sample to help us make a judgment about p, the population proportion. We could do the same thing with our good old friend x bar. That's the mean of a sample. We could likewise use the mean of a sample to help us make a judgment about mu, the population mean. And we could also do this with the slope of a regression line between two quantitative variables. We could take the slope that we see in a sample of data and we can make some judgments about what might be true for the population slope. Now there are two different types of inference procedures in AP statistics. The first is a confidence interval. A confidence interval is used when you have absolutely no idea what a population parameter is, but you would like to be able to estimate it. So you get a sample statistic and you start with that sample statistic and you create an interval around it. The idea is actually really simple. You take the simple statistic and you add and you subtract to it a margin of error. That's gonna wrap a nice interval around your sample statistic, which we call a point estimate. And we're pretty confident based on how much confidence in the problem, 90, 95, 99, we're pretty confident that the true population parameter will be in our interval. Now, a little bit more of an extended version of how to create a confidence interval is to take that sample statistic and we're going to add and subtract, like I said already, the margin of error. But the margin of error is a product of two things. It's our critical value, typically going to be a Z star or a T star, times the standard error of the statistic. Now, this generic formula is actually on the AP stats formula sheet. It just says, hey, a confidence interval is a statistic. Okay, a sample statistic, typically X bar, P hat. And then we're going to add and subtract, again, the margin of error, which is the combination of that critical value times the standard error of the statistic. Now, there are five intervals that you need to know how to calculate and interpret for the AP statistics exam. The first is a one sample Z interval for a population proportion. What proportion of men in Texas own a cowboy hat? I have no idea, but I can get a sample, and from that sample, I could get a sample proportion, and I could use that sample proportion to but a confidence interval for what the true proportion of men in Texas that wear a cowboy hat is. We could also do a two sample Z interval for the difference between population proportions. What's the difference between the proportion of men that wear a cowboy hat in Texas and the proportion of women that wear a cowboy hat in Texas? Well, I can get a sample from each, get the difference that I observed, add and subtract a margin of error as well, so I can figure out what the difference between those two population proportions could possibly be. Next up, we have a one sample T interval for a population mean. What is the mean weight of a jelly bean in a huge batch of thousands? Well, I don't know, but I can get a sample of jelly beans and get a mean weight from that sample, and I could use that sample mean as a point estimate and build a confidence interval around it in hopes of trying to find mu, the population mean of the weight of all the jelly beans. I could also do a two sample T interval for the difference between population means. What is the difference between the mean amount of times kids at school A spend on homework each night and the mean amount of time kids at school B spend on homework each night? Well, I could take a sample from each of those populations, I can get an observed difference, and I could build a confidence interval around it. Now, I know I mentioned five, but I'm gonna mention two more real quick. 
We could also do a one sample Z interval for a population mean. But to do a Z interval, we would need to know the standard deviation of the entire population. And in AP statistics, we typically don't know that. We only know the standard deviation of our sample, which is why we use a T interval. Likewise, I can do a two sample Z interval for the difference between population means. But again, I would need to know the standard deviation of each of those populations, which we typically don't know in AP statistics, which is why we use a T interval. Now, the idea that I always tell students is very simple. If you were to know the standard deviation of the population, then you could use a Z instead of a T. But think about it. If you know the standard deviation of the population, then chances are you probably know the mean of the population, so then you really wouldn't need the interval in the first place. So those commands are on your calculator and they are in a lot of textbooks, but we typically only stick with T intervals for both means and the difference between population means. The fifth type of interval that you need to know for the AP statistics exam is a T interval for the slope of a regression line in a population. Let me give you a quick example. A sample of 20 Darge chargers shows that for every one mile driven, the price decreases by 0.042, or about 4.2 cents for every one mile driven, the price goes down. But what's the true slope in the population of all Darge chargers? Well, I don't know, but we could take our sample slope that we found in our sample of 20 cars and we could add and subtract a margin of error to get, well, a confidence interval where we think the true slope resides. Now, for any one of those five intervals that I just mentioned, they all follow the four same steps, which makes it kind of convenient. Step one is to name the interval and clarify exactly what population parameter it is that you're trying to estimate. Step two is to check the conditions necessary for the specific interval. Step three is to use the formula to actually build the interval. And step four is to interpret the interval in context. Now, when you're working with an interval, they all start off with the statistic that you found, which is obviously always gonna be in the problem. Then we need that critical value, either the Z-score or T-score, that's gonna be the critical value for our interval that's based on how confident you wanna be. Now, to figure that out, typically you're gonna use either invert norm or invert T to find that Z-star or T-star. Now, when it comes to your standard error, Every one of the formulas that I've showed you in this video so far is on the AP Statistics Formula Sheet. You just gotta make sure you know where to look. If you're working with proportions, look in the box for proportions. One or the difference between two. Are you working with means? One or the difference between two. And in that chart on the formula sheet, you're gonna find the formulas for the standard error. And that's how you could calculate that back margin of error part. So it's actually quite simple. Everything you need is there. Just make sure you are very, very careful with your interpretation. This is where we wanna start off with, I'm 95% confident that, and you continue on with the context from the problem. We wanna make sure that we write that conclusion or that interpretation really, really nice and neatly. The second type of inference procedure in AP statistics is a significance test. Now here a current population parameter is given, but a claim is made that the true population parameter is either lower, higher, or simply something different, not equal to what we were told. Now, we're gonna use our sample statistic to be like evidence that's either is gonna support or not support our claim about that population parameter. So again, we're using a sample statistic to make a judgment about the population parameter. The general idea here is that we first have to build a sampling distribution for the sample statistic based on the null hypothesis being true. Then we take our sample statistic and locate it in that model. Is it significant, meaning it's really, really unlikely to occur, or is it, well, for lack of a better word, just normal? Now, to locate a sample statistic in a sampling distribution, we need its test statistic. Its test statistic is either going to be a Z-score if you're working with the normal model, or a T-score if you're working with the T-model. Now, the generic formula for a test statistic is given to you on the AP statistics exam. It looks like this you're gonna take the statistic that you observed in your sample, and you're gonna subtract the parameter that you believe to be true in the null hypothesis, and then you're gonna divide by the standard error of that statistic. And guess where you get the formula for that standard error? Oh yeah, it's on the formula sheet as well. All you gotta do is again, look it up. Are you working with proportions? Are you working with means? Are you working with slope? And that's gonna make sure that you get the right standard error formula for what you're given. Then once we have that Z-score or T-score, we could go ahead and calculate our P-value with it. And our P-value is gonna be the probability of our sample statistic occurring or more extreme, 
given that the null hypothesis is true. And if that p-value is really, really low, we're gonna reject the null and say that we do have evidence to say the alternative is true. Or otherwise, if the p-value is larger than our significance level, we're going to fail to reject the null, which means we do not have significant evidence that the alternative hypothesis is true. Let's talk about the different type of tests that you could see on the AP exam. There are nine different types of significance tests that could pop up on the AP exam. I know nine seems like an awful lot, but let's walk through them slowly and hopefully they'll all come back to you pretty quickly. And don't forget about that document I have that goes through examples of all of them. All right, first up is a one sample Z test for a population proportion. So here we're given some type of population proportion that we thought was true, but we claim that it's lower, higher, or simply not equal to. So we get a sample proportion located on our sampling distribution based on the null being true, calculate our p-value, and make our conclusion. The second type of test is a two sample Z test for the difference between two population proportions. Here the null hypothesis is that the two population proportions are equal, no different whatsoever. And then the alternative is, well, we think one is more than the other, we think one is less than the other, or we just think that they're different. So once again, we're gonna start off with our observed difference. We're gonna subtract zero, because that's what we assume to be true from the null hypothesis, and divide by our standard error. From there, we're gonna get our z-score, we could calculate our p-value and make our conclusion. Next up is a one sample t-test for a population mean. Now I could use a z-test here, but that would require that I know the population standard deviation, which in AP stats you're typically not gonna know, so that's why we're using a t-test. So here we're believing that we may know, or maybe we read what a population mean is, but we're gonna make a claim that we think it's lower, higher, or not equal to, so we're gonna get a sample mean, find where it falls on the sampling distribution built on the assumption that the null is true, Locate it, get the t-score, find our p-value, make our conclusion. Next up is a two-sample t-test for the difference between population means. So once again, very similar to a two-sample z-test for population proportions, we have a null that the two population means are equal, and the alternative is one is more or one is less than the other, and we're gonna take our observed difference, subtract zero, because again, we assume there's no difference, divide by our standard error, and then we're gonna go ahead and figure out what our p-value is. And with that p-value, we could go ahead and make a conclusion. It's a very similar process that you're hearing over and over and over again. The fifth type of significance test that could show up on the AP Statistics exam is a very special one. It's a match pair t-test for a mean difference. Now, to recognize this, you're going to have one sample, but it might look like two samples but you're just measuring that one sample twice. Like maybe you have one group of people, you measure them before and you measure them after, something along those lines. So it's really coming from a matched pair experiment. What we care about is not what happened first or second or left or right, we care about the difference. So we wanna create one list of differences and all we care about is the mean of those differences. Now our null hypothesis is that the mean of the differences in the entire population is zero, there's no difference. And the alternative is we think there is a difference, greater than zero, less than zero, or simply not equal to. And then we use the sample difference that we saw to create our z-score or t-score and then go ahead and calculate our p-value. Now the next three types of tests all stem from categorical data. Now here we're talking about chi-squared. So test six is a chi-squared for goodness to fit. This is when we have one categorical variable with multiple categories across it. And we want to see how well our observed data fits with what we expect. This next type of chi-squared test is a chi-squared test for independence. This is where we have a two-way table and we're wondering if there is independence or association or no association between the two variables. And the third type of chi-squared test is a chi-squared test for homogeneity. Here we have multiple different samples and from each sample we're looking at multiple different categories and we basically want to know are the categories the same or different across our different samples. Now, a chi-squared test for independence and a chi-squared test for homogeneity are very, very, very similar in everything that happens with them other than just how we word it, but they all stem from two-way categorical tables. The ninth and final test is probably the most rare on the AP stats exam, but it does come up every now and then, and this is a test for the slope of a regression line. Here, the null hypothesis is that their true slope 
between two quantitative variables is zero. There's no relationship whatsoever. And the alternative is that there is a slope, whether it be a positive slope greater than zero or negative slope less than zero, but we truly believe that there is a slope between these two variables. So we simply start off with a sample slope that we saw in a sample of data, and then we calculate its T-score, and then we calculate the P-value. Overall, it's a very similar process, not too bad. Now here's the good news. No matter what type of the nine tests you're gonna use, they all follow the same basic format of four steps. Step one is to define the parameter of interest. What is the population parameter that you're interested in in that problem? And then you're gonna create your null and your alternative hypothesis based on what's said in the problem. Step two is check the conditions necessary for the test and build the model on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. The third step is to me the most fun. This is where we're actually gonna calculate our test statistic, typically gonna be our Z-score or T-score or your chi-squared value, if that's what you're gonna go with for a chi-squared test. And then with that T-score, Z-score or chi-squared, you're going to calculate your P-value. And then the fourth step, again, is where we're gonna conclude it all. We're gonna use our P-value to make a decision. I've already mentioned that a P-value below a significance level is going to cause you to reject the null. You do have evidence for the alternative. A P-value above your level of significance is going to cause you to fail to reject the null. You do not have enough evidence to say that the alternative is true. That doesn't mean the null is true. We just don't have enough evidence to say otherwise. Well, that's it. Those are all the different procedures of statistical inference that could show up on the AP stats exam. And I know that might be a little bit overwhelming, but that's where the packet I have created for you comes in. It goes over every single one of those different scenarios, and it gives you a pass free response question that is exactly that type of procedure. Whether it be a one sample Z test, a two sample T test, the difference between means, whatever it is, or even a chi-square test, it walks you through it, it shows you all the work, it shows you step by step what needs to be done. That way, if you see one of these problems on the AP exam, and let me correct myself, you will see one of these problems on the AP exam, you'll be ready to ace it. So head on over to Ultimate Review Packet for AP Statistics and get that document. It's going to help you tremendously, I promise.